Chemistry is the study of the composition, properties, and interactions of matter. So matter is any object that you can hold in your hand. It's something that has mass and takes up space. So for example, a light bulb would be uh, an example of matter, but the light that comes from a light bulb would not be an example of matter because it, you can't really hold light in your hand. It doesn't have any mass and it doesn't take up any volume. So whereas a light bulb would be considered matter, light would be considered energy. So generally those two concepts, matter and energy, make up everything in the universe. We can put everything in the universe into one of those categories. It's either matter or it's energy. So chemistry is called the central science. And that means that um, lots of different areas of science have to be familiar with chemistry, which uh, sometimes students wonder why they have to take a chemistry class depending on their specific major. Well, the reason is because even if you're not going to be a chemist in the future, every different kind of science and even some areas that we might not consider science have to do with chemistry because uh, all of these different disciplines have to do with matter. And chemists study matter and study chemicals and study compounds and molecules and all of these different disciplines to some extent have something to do with that. Um, so chemistry uh, is kind of at the nexus of lots of different disciplines um, and chemistry is an important tool for scientists in lots of different disciplines. So the scientific method is uh, the way that science is advanced. Um, the scientific method is something, is just a way of looking at the world, a way of making an observation and asking questions and making predictions um, and trying to see if your predictions uh, were actually true or if they it turned out that your predictions were wrong. So the first step in the scientific method is always an observation. Uh, something happens in the natural world and um, a scientist makes an observation, uh, maybe a pattern, and tries to give that pattern some kind of explanation. So when uh, an observation is made, the, the next step is to try to explain that observation, come up with some uh, reason why you're seeing what you're seeing. Um, after a hypothesis is made, then experiments can be performed to determine whether or not your hypothesis is correct. Um, for example, uh, my, the mileage on my car seems to be decreasing, so it probably needs a tune-up. So um, that would be your hypothesis, and you could make an experiment and check that hypothesis. If you get a tune-up and your gas mileage increases, then your hypothesis was potentially correct. Um, if you get a tune-up and your gas mileage doesn't increase, then your hypothesis was wrong. So uh, that could be an experiment that you would perform to uh, determine whether or not your hypothesis was correct, trying to explain the observation that your truck had low mileage. Um, a, a theory is something that comes after a hypothesis. So generally, a hypothesis is a, an explanation of something, but it's an explanation that is not well accepted because it hasn't been tested enough times. It's just a, an initial idea. A theory is also an explanation, but it's an explanation that has been tested many, many, many times by many different people, and the explanation has always been true to explain this observation, whatever it may be. So um, a scientist makes an observation, makes a hypothesis to try to explain that observation, and if lots of different scientists also use that hypothesis to explain the, their observation, if it's always true, then that becomes elevated to the status of a theory. So um, both hypotheses and theories are explanations of some uh, particular aspect. A law is more like an observation. So um, an observation might be something like 
uh, the pressure, is, the barometric pressure is dropping um, at, uh, right before a storm. So if you look at your barometer and the pressure starts to go down and then a storm happens, that would be an observation. Barometric pressure decreased and a storm occurred. You're not necessarily saying one is due to the other. You're not trying to make an explanation. You're just making an observation. But when that observation happens to be true, every single time that, every, that different people make it, that say a drop in barometric pressure is followed by a storm, then that observation becomes elevated to the status of a law. So observations and laws are very similar. They're not trying to explain anything. They're just the way it is. You, I am wearing a red shirt today. It's not an explanation. It's just a statement of fact. And when that statement has been, uh, that observation has been made many times uh, by many different people, and it always seems to be true, then we call that a law. So the, the law of gravity, things on Earth always fall down. You're not trying to explain anything. You're just making an observation that when you drop something, it falls down. And it always falls down, and it's always fallen down. Therefore, that observation has become a law. So hypotheses and theories are related in that they are explanations. Observations and laws are related in that they are more statement, a statement of fact. So um, the first step, again, is, is having some observation. And then you make some kind of hypothesis to explain your observation. And if you can make a, an experiment to explain that uh, hypothesis, and your hypothesis turns out to be consistent with the, the prediction, your experimental results were consistent with the prediction, um, then that strengthens your hypothesis. It doesn't turn your hypothesis into a theory because you need to make lots of experiments and lots of observations and many people need to do it again and again in order for a hypothesis to graduate to become a theory. So um, a hypothesis will never become a law. Observations become laws and hypotheses become theories. Chemists study and describe the behavior of matter and energy in three different domains. The macroscopic domain, the microscopic domain, and the symbolic domain. So the macroscopic domain is what we see with our eyes and what we're most familiar with in the everyday world. Uh, macro means big. So big in this context means things that are similar to us, that are big enough that we can see with our eyes. Um, that we don't need a microscope for, uh, which brings us to the micro world. In the microscopic domain, you need a microscope in order to view that domain. It's too small for us to see with our eyes. So when we're talking about chemistry, it's important to look at macroscopic features of, for example, an iceberg to see the shape of the iceberg, the color of the iceberg, um, different properties at the level at which we can see with our eyes and then it's important to look a little bit closer under the microscope and see if maybe there are some kind of particulates stuck inside of the iceberg maybe some kind of dust or something that uh, gives it its color for example or might be uh, increasing the rate at which it melts and then we can look even further at the um, the symbolic domain, which is really where we try to take these, uh, these observations that we've made in the macroscopic and microscopic world and try to represent them um, in maybe a simplified way so th that they're easier to work with. So um, H2O is not real in a lot of senses. It's a representation that we use as a stand-in for a molecule of water. A molecule of water is a real object, and it has two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Um, but H2O, the symbol that we use to represent that molecule, is 
just a symbol. It's just a picture, and we could have used other letters, and we could have used other representations. So um, thinking about a molecule of water contains a lot of information, a lot of details. There is how big each atom is, how far apart the atoms are, the angle between the atoms, um, whether there's an electrical dipole moment. There's a lot of information that is contained within the actual object, a molecule of water. Um, and sometimes we're not, a lot of that information is not pertinent to the discussion that we're having. So we use different representations like H2O to try to um, discuss certain properties um, of water molecules without having to have all the extra detail that might get in the way of our understanding. So it's important in this class for us to be able to move in between these different domains. Uh, we're obviously very familiar with what we can see with our eyes, but then we're going to have to connect that to what we can't see with our eyes, that we have to look in a microscope or sometimes um, even smaller than that. Uh, you can use x-ray data to look at individual atoms, which are too small to see under a microscope. Um, but those are things that we're not familiar with. The microscopic level is something that we don't have an intuitive sense for. It's very different than the macroscopic world. And um, to make those connections, we utilize the symbolic world, the symbolic domain, so that we can try to simplify features of the, of the microscopic domain or the macroscopic domain so that it's easier for us to understand um, where these connections are. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video here for a couple of minutes and think about this question and uh, try to give it a shot here. Okay, so the answer is that the following um, examples of matter are wood, air, medicine, atoms, and stars. All of these objects have mass and take up space. Sound does not. You can't weigh sound. You can't weigh light. You can't weigh electricity. If I have a wire that doesn't have electricity going through it, and then I put a current across that wire, it doesn't gain mass. So electricity is not an example of matter. So all of those others are examples of energy, in fact. Okay, go ahead and pause this one now. Pause the video again and give this one a shot. Okay, identify each of the following statements as being most similar to a hypothesis, a law, or a theory. Falling barometric pressure precedes the onset of bad weather. So this is one that we actually had talked about. Um, the first time that that observation was made, it was just an observation. But when it had been made again and again and again, and it always turned out to be true, then it graduated and became a law. Two, all life on Earth has evolved from a common primitive organism through the process of natural selection. That would be a theory. Uh, when Darwin first made that suggestion, it was a hypothesis. But since then, that hypothesis has been tested with experiments by many different scientists again and again and again, and it's always explained the results that they've seen. So that hypothesis graduated and became a theory. Number three, my truck's gas mileage has dropped significantly, probably because it's due for a tuna. Um, the word probably here is a great giveaway. If it's probably, then it's not widely accepted. Probably is um, a hunch, and hunches are not laws. Um, a law is something that is always true, and your gas mileage dropping significantly uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's due for a tune-up. There are other reasons, and so we can't necessarily graduate that hypothesis to a law just yet.